Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to one and all present here from all around the world. Uh, Water Youth Network welcomes you all to the Water and Climate webinar series. Uh, this webinar is hosted by the governance group of Water Youth Network and myself, Bhola Shaha from India, will be your host for the webinar. Today's topic of discussion is water governance and sustainability, exploring perspectives and best practices. The Water Youth Network is a global and inclusive connector in the water sector with a vibrant community of students and young professionals across disciplines. We do not try to compete with other water youth organizations. We connect existing ones and promote them. The Water Youth Network is neither an implementation organization nor a fund. Therefore, empowering, connecting, and change making is our motto. We value inclusion, innovation, and a collaborative spirit. Overall, the aim of the Water Youth Network is to offer a platform online and offline for young people to exchange knowledge with one another, to promote their inclusion in decision-making process, and to facilitate the adoption of youth-friendly policies at all levels. Through this network, we hope to encourage a spirit of ongoing learning and exchange between many generations of water professionals, which will be extremely valuable to address the expanding water challenges faced by the planet. Let me start off by quoting the words said during the Global Water Partnership in the year 2002. Governance is an inclusive concept that embraces the relationship between society and government. Water governance refers to the range of political, social, economic, administrative systems that are in place to develop and manage water resources and the delivery of water services at different levels of society. As per European Consortium of Political Research, there are several challenges in water governance due to climate change, biodiversity loss, urbanization, and population growth. Climate change is often referred to as a wicked problem in the water governance, characterized by high levels of uncertainty, interconnectivity, and complex dynamics, which hinders the path to have a sustainable society. To have a good water governance, the government and the society must engage in reforming the water sector with socioeconomic, political, and environmental framework. It cannot be limited to a single discipline or academic domain, but rather requires a deep interdisciplinary approach. With further ado, I would like to introduce all the participants to today's speaker for the webinar. We have with us Dr. Ripal Kanji, research scientist and program manager at Gujarat Institute of Disaster Management, GIDM, Gujarat, India, and Dr. Neha Mida, professor, uh, a program officer for natural sciences, UNESCO, New Delhi Cluster, India. Our first speaker, Dr. Ripal Kanji, is a disaster risk reduction professional, presently working as a research scientist and program manager at GIDM. He is also the director of Risk and Resilience Institute, an entrepreneurship organization in DRR. He is also one of the founding member of Confederation of Risk Reduction Professionals, CRRP India, a not-for-profit organization, which, which is a platform for youth and young professionals in disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. He is also an IRDR young scientist. He has a PhD in building disaster resilience through corporate social responsibility from the prestigious Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. Our second speaker, Dr. Neha Mida, is an environmental professional presently working as program officer with UNESCO New Delhi office for its natural sciences program. She provides technical expertise and operational support for UNESCO's intergovernmental hydrological program, man and biosphere, and science policy and capacity building programs for six South Asian countries. She has a 10 years of experience in natural resource management, sustainability, water resource management, and wildlife conservation. She has PhD in natural resource management from Wildlife Institute of India and post-graduation in environment management from Forest Research Institute, India. I would like to thank both of our speakers for accepting our invitation. Without further delay, I would request Dr. Ripal Kanji to share his valuable thoughts on water governance and its associated risks. Sir, the floor is all yours. 
thank you bola thank you so much for that uh, full blown introduction that you gave and it actually it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be a part of this discussion which is i think much required and uh, yeah let's uh, let's begin the session without any further ado just let me know if my screen is visible i'm uh, beginning to share my screen uh, yeah is it visible yeah okay great uh, yes so we will be talking about water governance today and uh, just as a warning to everyone present today i would like to say that since i am a disaster risk management professional uh, whatever i discuss whatever i talk today will have a certain biasness towards disaster risk management so apologies for that and before i start i hope everyone who has joined the program the session uh, is healthy and let's let's start discussing what everything is about today well i will be talking about governing our own risks and in order to govern risk we need to look ahead look around and act and act, when i say act i do mean act now as bola rightly pointed out if you try to understand what what a governance is it basically refers to four pillars political social economic and administrative these systems are in place and it influences the use of water and its management now you can look at it just like a definition or else you can also think of it as an idea that these four pillars are not merely the dimensions or aspects of water governance they are actually the dimensions of impacts also and that they are very very minutely connected to each other for example if we talk about only the political aspect of it it won't be enough the political aspect is related to the administrative aspect and they have impacts on the social and the economic well-being of the greater society so as a definition yes it it is a very classic way of putting water governance but then as as young professionals perhaps or researchers or academicians it's very important for us to understand that these are not merely aspects or dimensions which limits itself to the definition of water governance perhaps it goes beyond it and that is what we need to understand and that is what i will try to highlight in my presentation moving ahead <clears throat> this was also pointed out by bola quite well that uh, water governance is practically multisectoral it involves multiple sectors and when i am talking about multiple sectors because i also have a background in the government i am referring to the involvement of multiple dep departments in the government and it is actually very difficult in a government system in a full blown government system you know to come together and work as a gear when one one of the gear falls on the other so it's very very difficult i it's easy to conceptualize but it's very difficult when it's come to the implementation part so multi sectoral is one of the key things that we have to take into account the second thing is the entire aura of water governance is transdisciplinary in nature and it's it's not merely the involvement of various academic academic fields it's it's more more of it right and the point is that although through all these kind of definitions and understanding that we have developed uh, down the years we perceive the entire issue in this transdisciplinary and multisectoral lens but when it but when it comes to acting on it we generally act in silos that is very very uh, problematic right and when we fail to understand this this interlinkages this this interdependencies the systemic nature of all these issues that is how the risks that we are trying to govern today manifest itself 
and then it eventually leads into some catastrophe or mishap, which uh, we in our field of disaster risk management call as a disaster. So what I'm trying to point out is that there are interlinkages in places. Most of the times they are not perceived. We do understand that we need to perceive, but we do not, we fail somehow. And that is where the systemic nature of this, this entire discipline is left behind. And we do not understand the systemic nature of risk that is being generated. So what I'm trying to say is that risks are systemic, but the crisis that manifests when the risk goes beyond the capacity of the community at large, the crisis that originates, the crises are like dominoes, they are cascading. So the risks are systemic in nature, but the crises are cascading. Now, there are multitudes of examples. In fact, I will not go beyond the state where I work. Currently now, I will bring forth examples from my state only. And I will try to show you that whatever I was talking about, the systemic nature of risk or, or the lack of perceiving it through that transdisciplinary lens is failing. For example, this is an example uh, from August 2019 in a city, uh, Baroda in Gujarat, the state that I work in. And it, it's evident what you see on your screen. It's completely flooded, right? This is one case in the same state. Now, we move on a little farther away from Baroda, and what we see is another case. Let me introduce you to a person named as Bhavan Bhai Patel. Now, this person lives in a place, uh, a village rather, which is known as Dayapur in a region in Kutch, which is also in Gujarat. Now, he says that since 2003, the rainfall that is received by this area has not been substantial. And since that is the problem, people are out migrating. Now, this started with a hamlet of almost 20,000 people, and now it's down to 1,500, right? Now, let, let, let's not talk about the climate change aspect of it, because nowadays what happens is that we try to relate every problem to climate change. So let's just keep the climate change aspect apart, and let's talk about what we can do, what we could have done. Now, this area where this Bhavan Bhai Patel is from is just merely 520 kilometers away from one of the, one of the greatest water canal project that India has. It's the Namada water canal project, right? And it was, um, and, and basically it was conceived, the entire idea of this project, the Namada Valley project was conceived in 1946. But then when we talk about the political and the administrative angles of water governance as such, many players come into the picture, right? Specifically when you are in a federal or a pseudo-federal structure of governance where, uh, where you have uh, the central government, where you have the state government. So what happens is that although you conceive a very well notion project, the implementation becomes very difficult because it's about sharing the resources among states, right? So what happened is that although this project was conceived in 1946, uh, there was a lot of disputes that went in. And finally, in 1969, a water dispute tribunal was, uh, was founded just to resolve this issue. And later, in uh, 1979, that is 1979, that's almost 10 years later uh, after the tribunal was set up, a decision was made among the conflicting states as to what, how much of water, or how much of resources goes into each of the states, right? And it was also decided that the state of Gujarat will not use more than 11% of the water that has been allocated to it for uh, uh, non-industrial purposes. Unfortunately, it went beyond that. And so what happens is that when most of the resources are going to these kind of uses, there's no water left for agriculture. And this brings back to the story of Bhavan Bhai Patel, why his hamlet, why those 20,000 people had to out migrate. So what I'm trying to bring in is the notion that water governance or the governance of resources is very difficult when it actually comes into play, right? There are so many aspects that you have to take care. And when, when it's actually a well set up government working, 
it's very difficult to get something done. It takes a long while. It gets done, but it takes a long while. And during this long while, there are a lot of social and economic impacts that happen. And although no one wants that, but it actually happens. So that's the political and the administrative angles that I wanted to highlight. Now, let's take a little bit of more time to understand if we can kind of outline those particular aspects which contributes to the success of water governance or the failure of water governance. I do not want to make this session a boring one, so I will not go into the details of what I have done here. But simply put, what I want to do is talk about uh, sub, uh, some of the examples that I have been studying all this while are taken from different countries and they primarily talk about the same essence. The essence that they have behind their success is the same. For example, if we talk about Australia in the period of 1970s, uh, they, the, 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 the entire project that constituted all this was a huge success. But what was behind it? The, the factors that contributed to its success was simple. It was a bottom-up process. There were reforms in leadership. More power were delegated to local authorities. These were the things that actually plays an important part, right? If we talk about Chile, what happened is that water pricing and watershed governance. Now, when, when you talk about water pricing, it's not only about financing, but it's also about putting accountability into it, right? And when you're accountable, you are also responsible. So these are the aspects that were brought in and they contributed to the success. Now, if we talk about Mexico, it also has the same kind of things, decentralization of water governance. So these are the factors, some of the factors actually, that contributes to the success of overall the system of water governance when we talk about it. Now, if we talk about what are those factors which contribute to the failure? Now, uh, prima facie, it would appear that uh, those factors which contribute to the success, the complete opposite would uh, contribute to the failure of it. And, and it's kind of the right thing, but there are additional issues also. For example, uh, let's take the case of Sri Lanka. The government claims ownership of all these surface water bodies. Now, this is where uh, the, the idea of decentralization just goes down into the drain. Now, you have to give people the responsibility of managing their own resources, and that is how you develop accountability. And that is the factor which was completely missing in this case. Well, in case of India, the caste system, the socio-economic stature, created a lot of problems. And that is a hindrance, even today, in implementation of many projects. Uh, in uh, implementation of many projects, not only about uh, the projects which relates to water resources. Now, if we talk about South Asia as a whole, the problems are kind of similar, yet a little bit of different because they are somehow contextualized. Right? Uh, there are prevalence of informal payments, and uh, there are uh, issues of governance contracts that are given out and a little bit of corruption also added to it. So when you talk about a region, there are similarities in the, uh, similarities in the success factors, there are similarities in the failure factors, a little bit of contextualized, but more, moreover, it's, it's actually the same thing that we are talking about, right? So if we, are, if we are to kind of make a list of all these factors, what we see is that what contributes to the success are bottom-up approach, when you give more power, more responsibility, more accountability to the people to manage their own resources. Privatization also works in certain cases. Scaling of the lessons learned. It's not that we are doing everything for the first time, right? Uh, we have been in this world for like a long, long while and we have lessons that we have learned. But the only thing is that perhaps we do not look back and I will give you a good example of it. So the idea is to look back, learn, and scale those things according to the quantum that we have grown into, the quantum of globalization that we have undergone. So we'll have to scale the lessons that we have learned. And accountability and responsibility, of course, we have talked a lot about it. National consensus is something very important. Uh, for example, if you talk about India, there was this movement, um, it's also ongoing right now, Swachh Bharat movement. There has been a built up of national consensus the people in general, they are motivated to do something. And that also uh, works to motivate the political will, which finally 
kind of oils the gears of the administrative system and everything falls into place. So there is also a necessity of the people in large, the population in general, to understand that this is good for us. So that, that there is a need to build a national consensus about things, right? And if we talk about failure, centralization, as we saw in the case of Sri Lanka, of course, you can go into the details of the case studies, but just to outline the factors, centralization, unorganized systems in place, for example, giving out the governance contracts, uh, giving out contracts pertaining to uh, water systems, there are problems there. So these are the things um, that contributes to the failure of this entire issue. Now, the thing is that we, it, it's not that we are not aware of these problems. We are aware of these problems, but now we have to move forward, right? So when we move forward, what happens is that generally what happens is that we uh, forget to take stock of something which we cannot imagine of, cannot think of. For example, COVID-19, this pandemic that we are going through right now, this we never imagined. Of course, yes, when you, when you go back and see the guidelines uh, of, of different organizations, for example, different authorities, different uh, organizations, for example, WHO, they, they have these guidelines in place. But for some reason, we have failed to take stock of that, right? So when we are talking about uh, COVID-19 in particular, we all knew that there is a chance of a pandemic breaking out, right? There is a chance of having an epidemic in a, in, a, in a small region. But somehow we know all this, but still we tend to ignore it. And, and it's very interesting to see how these issues of water resources, these issues of water governance, very subtly fits into the problem. When, when, uh, when the pandemic was just, just beginning to phase out in a, in a massive scale, uh, the World Bank came out, or, uh, came out with a tool specifically for the South Asian region, uh, for the governments to help understand which, which are those areas uh, which are more prone to becoming a hotspot for COVID-19. Now, they took into account many factors, but one of the most important factors that I want to point out is that they, uh, they underlined the availability of resources, for example, water pumps, as a potential factor which can contribute to an area becoming a COVID hotspot, right? Now, those who are aware of the scenario, the population density, the demographics of South Asia will understand that there are many regions where a large number of people depend on a single source of water. Now, on, on one hand, you are saying that to get rid of this virus, you need to clean your hands on a regular basis. And then you do not have water. You have to go out of your house to a common place where, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 people are gathering together and, and you are supposed to collect water from there. And added to this is that there, there is this notion that the collection of water, this particular job, is given to the female of the house. So, so you're getting my point, how, how these all things, which uh, presumably we cannot foresee, but it actually fits in very subtly into the problems. So water governance, although which is politically, politically inclined, administratively geared, but the impacts, which I was talking about, impacts are social, the impacts are also economic. So these are the things that we generally miss, but we should take into account. Now, let me give you another example. This is, a, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is from uh, 1930, basically. There's this place in Honduran city, Choluteca, and there's this bridge. Now, this part of the world is uh, prone to extreme weather conditions. So these people thought that let's get help from outside the world, uh, from, from different parts of the world. Let's uh, bring all the engineers, all the architects together and let's make a bridge which is resistant. I'm not using the word resilient, I'm using the word resistant to all these kinds of extreme weather events. Voila, of course, all the brains together, they did it. They ma made the bridge. And then in 1998, there was Hurricane Mitch. Most of the infrastructure went down except this bridge. But what happened is very interesting. This is what happened. The river shifted its course. So what I'm trying to bring you is that uh, the issues that we face now, we see it as if it, it, it will extend to a period of, let's say, 15, 30, 50, maybe, maybe till the period of our lifetime. But it's not that. It's something that we generally use to exemplify in our field of disaster risk management. When we say that there are 
huge floods having a 50 year return period that is these kind of this huge magnitude floods can come only after 50 years but this does not mean that this kind of flood will not occur tomorrow it's only that its probability is less but this this entire notion that this will not affect me in my lifetime gets us into these kind of problems so every system that we design we design it perfectly to get the results what we want but the scope of our result is inherently a little bit of parochial where we are not considering something we cannot foresee so that's another problem that we need to take care of now when i was talking about this bridge i mentioned that all the brains brought together they they are using the best of technologies they have they are, they are using the best of uh, uh, principles or they have to construct this bridge and and what happens is that in this particular flow what happens is that we kind of feel that this modernization is what we actually want what we actually seek and in this pursuit of modernity we fail to look back i will give you a very good example of dr rajendra singh who is regarded as the waterman of india it's very very common but i want to bring this out that this guy is known as the waterman of india for building 11800 johars which are basically percolation ponds and reviving more than 14 rivers and he did not use modern technologies to do it he relied on traditional technique to do it and some basic sciences and and how did all of this all of all of journey of this man begin? it began from a single statement by one of his patients when when one of his patients said that dude listen your medicines are not going to work what we need is access to clean water and that one statement was enough to motivate this guy to do what he has done till now almost 34 years uh, in field so the point is that it's not only about modern technologies we should not become too reliant on science and technology to the extent that we forget that we also have examples we also have experience to, experiences to learn from the past that is one thing and the second thing is that we need to understand that there are times when we have to you know kind of understand what our responsibilities to the society is now this man understood it when his patient talked to us and and i'm pretty sure that most of us have encountered such similar incidents in life when when you know we kind of take a step back and think no this is something that i have to do so these are the two things that also we have to take consideration of looking back and also taking stock of that particular point in time where, where you are kind of made aware that you need to act and perhaps with climate change and all these issues looming large the time is now to act okay uh, so modern problems require modern solutions of course now see all of these problems that i discussed is nothing new most of us are familiar to it but the thing is that we are still here we do realize that when we are working when we are functioning in this entire gamut of water governance there are so many departments of the government involved there are so many sectors there are so many academic fields that are involved but still we are failing to puncture the silos we are still failing to understand the dependencies which are spanning across the sectors it's not that uh, uh, when we are talking about water governance it's only the hydrologists or the civil engineers that needs to get involved it's not that a failure in a particular infrastructure in a uh, water infrastructure will eventually lead to the loss of economy we do understand it but simply we cannot you know kind of foresee it practically and uh, act towards it so while we are doing all this we also need to consider the emergent risks the, the risks which we are prone to in the future we cannot see it right now but but eventually it's going to happen so we also have to take stock of that so once we are done with all this probably that is when we start acting and now this is the most important thing that yes we are here we understand all our problems but what would what do we do and i feel personally this is my personal opinion that most of this most of the responsibility the onus rests on the youth 
the young scientists, the young professionals, because they, they, they have the spirit to, you know, kind of contribute to become a part of the solution and not the problem. When you, when you talk about linking the aspects of water governance with the attributes of what youth and young professionals can do, you see that when, when we talk about the social aspect, the social features, youth are the ones who are more active. They're like omnipresent. They, they are on Twitter, they are on Instagram, they are on Facebook, they are flooded with information. The only thing is that we have to understand that we are not here to kind of contribute to infodemic, but we are here to understand what information is necessary, how to communicate it, to whom to communicate, right? When we talk about the economic aspect of water governance and match it to the economic feature of youth and young professionals, most of the young professionals today, uh, given the lower uh, employability things and all that that's going around, uh, most of the youth are looking into something which is called the social entrepreneurship, right? So that is also there. And political and administrative aspects of water governance will match to the feature of youth and young professionals. Well, youth and young professionals and all, all, all of us kind of the water youth network, the entire youth network is capable of influencing all these kind of acts, all these kind of legislations, all these kind of frameworks to be particularly if we talk about. So the, um, the, the characteristics, the aspects of water governance kind of fits well with the features, with the dimensions of what, what the youth and young professionals largely have. So this is what we should kind of, you know, zero into because we know that we have the problems and this is the section of the society. These are the people, these are the group of people who can actually contribute to the solution of these problems. But of course, there are problems also. I mean, uh, when, when I talk about contributing to the solution and not the problem, we, those, those of us who are, are in developed nations or in developing nations or in the urban setting, we, are, we have more access to resources. But also there are people, there are also youth who have this impulse to contribute, but they do not have the resource to contribute. So that is also another aspect that we need to take care of. And perhaps that is why we have the uh, organization, we have networks like Water Youth Network to not only kind of bind in all the people who already are contributing in some way, but also to pull in those resources, those human resources who have the potential to contribute, but they cannot contribute because they have not been mainstreamed in a way. So that is how uh, I think we should move ahead. And uh, that would be the end of my presentation with a certain keyword that I would like to kind of reiterate is that all of us know the problem. We know the issues that we have at hand, right? We also know how to treat it. We know the medicines, but somehow we are failing to gap this bridge. And that is where I feel the youth, the young professionals have a major role to play. And in fact, Networks like Water Youth Network, or even when we are talking about uh, United Nations organizations, so the working group UNNGCY, they are the ones who have to pull in all those human resources who have not yet been mainstreamed, but they have the potential to contribute. So we know the problems, we know the solutions. The only thing is that we have to act. And we are, when we are acting, we should start acting now. And we will not act until and unless we look forward we look behind, look into our past experiences, look around us because there are many things happening. There are many interdependencies that are in place. The entire world has now become systemic. So that is how I would want to rest my case that it's up to the youth to take all of this agenda of sustainable development, including disaster resilience, including water governance forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, you have beautifully summed up how water governance plays an integral part of the society and helps to achieve sustainability. You have cited examples of water governance risk and how the youth can play a vital role. Now, I would request Dr. Neha Medha to share her experience and knowledge about the various approaches adopted in India with respect to water governance. I'm handing over the platform to you, ma'am. Thank you, Bhola. Uh, 
So Ripal has uh, already talked about what is water governance, what are the issue challenges, and I would like to talk about what organization like UNESCO is doing uh, towards it. So I'm sharing my screen. Okay, uh, so before I do that, I would like to talk, give a little background about the organization. Um, yeah, so UNESCO is United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. It's a specialized agency within the framework of uh, United Nations. It was established in uh, 1945 during the time when uh, World War II was uh, getting over and countries were coming together and were looking for an organization that can actually contribute in making a culture of peace. Uh, so that's how UNESCO came into being. And at that time, it was thought that education and culture are the two tools which can be, which, which fit here when we are talking about peace, when we are talking about development. But Hiroshima bombing happened at that time. And the thought process came that science was used for destruction. So at that point, it was thought that we have to use, we have to harness the power of science and innovation for peace and development. That's how in, in UNESCO, education, science and culture, all these three different things has curved together. And uh, presently, UNESCO have uh, 193 member states. Member states are basically countries who are member of UNESCO. And India is one of the founding member of UNESCO. And I work for uh, UNESCO New Delhi office. So within the UNESCO, uh, the water works uh, under the division of uh, water sciences uh, with the program uh, of international hydrological program, which I'm going to talk about how it works on water governance. Uh, there is a water world assessment program. Uh, then there is an Institute of Water Education. Then there are different centers which member states, countries propose as being a member to be designated by UNESCO as their category center. So all the work to all the programs happen through this center. And that's how the contribution to the member state is made. So International Hydrological Program of UNESCO, as I said, is an intergovernmental scientific program. It was created in 19, 1975 and it works in phases. I will not go into detail. So the present phase, it's the eighth phase and it talks about, it focuses on mobilization of international cooperation towards improving knowledge and innovation to strengthen the science and policy and capacity building is, is, is there at every step. So if, if you look at water governance, as Ripoll said, it's at every level. It's at district level, it's at state level, it's at center level, regional level, and even international level. So UNESCO presently in its eighth phase is working on six themes to work on local, regional and global, to work at local, regional and global challenges. So one of the first thing is, uh, first theme is water related disaster. Second is groundwater. Third is addressing water scarcity, water and human settlement, eco-hydrology and water education. So I will give you example case studies from each of the theme to make, to, uh, to set, to set to how UNESCO works in what, on water governance. To start with is eco-hydrology. Eco-hydrology is basically a subdivision of hydrology, which takes into account ecological engineering solution, which have been uh, tried, tested for hydrological processes or vice versa. To give you an example, uh, so in UNESCO, um, it's, it's the, is the demonstration sites which have been uh, picked up or identified. They are usually nominated by countries where, uh, where they have examples where um, 
insights they have used uh, ecological engineering solution and they would like to share it with the world and that's how there are right now 24 demonstration sites in 18 countries india has not nominated any any such site so one of the site i would like to share example is from the poland it's on the pelika uh, river so the issue was here excessive use of uh, uh, fertilizer and uh, and the and the flow from the agriculture field towards the pelika river there that was causing the water pollution and that the water pollution then going downstream and then different states and then how that's how the problem of water governance between different states coming and and the what ecological engineering solution was put in was uh, trying out the solution of ecotones ecotones is basically the barrier or uh, a permanent vegetation stretch along the river so that the pollution can be reduced at the at the source only so this is the basic the flow from the agriculture area and then if we have an ecotone between the land and the river how it can be reduced and then uh, different research and studies was done um, in Poland uh, with support from UNESCO that uh, what are the plant diversity uh, which uh, the first for, first of all natural ecotones present in the Poland were studied and their design was studied uh, then which plant diversity should be there then how much width uh, width of the ecotone uh, should be there so that there is a, a maximum reduction of nitrate and phosphate coming from the agriculture field and they came out with a with a design of uh, where the along the river where the plants should be there where the vegetative uh, ecotone should be there where so they so to increase the effectiveness they tried different things also they tried to put in a denitrification wall also which is a vertical trench which is digging to contract the uh, the groundwater uh, so that the nitrate get converted into nitrogen so they also use geochemical barrier so they made a kind of design and the design didn't stay till that they made a multi stakeholder platform to share their ideas all <clears throat> across the Poland, especially with the local communities, those are those have the agriculture lands so that they can stop the pollution at the source only. Uh, so to another theme, I would like to share an example from as uh, water and human settlement. So this example is from Davos, South Asia, Philippines. So this example is like Ripoll uh, said the silos is between two agencies, two department doesn't talk about. So this is the example from Philippines. So, so from Philippines, um, it's one of the countries where um, uh, climate change are, is going to impact first or it's already impacting and they are uh, seeing the problem of urban flooding happening in, in a, uh, the frequency has increased similarly with the Indian cities is almost the same. But in Philippines, uh, they have they have accepted that there is an issue they have accepted that the climate change they have to do something because because of the geographical their geographical location and with support from unesco the project is project was uh, done where they where they reviewed their disaster risk uh, disaster risk planning uh, planning and uh, and it was and it was uh, recognized that uh, the disaster risk planning is mainly about people safety but when these emergencies happen then the point which get left out is how the water would be supplied to all the people uh, the quality of the water or the quantity of the water which uh, which population would be required especially in the time of urban flooding how that how the water will actually reach to the people so that was somehow left out so that part was brought in in this disaster uh, risk management so even the review was done till the district level so the policy was making at the center level then the review was done to the district level so district has to give information where is their urban water structure is where is their location what is their status where the upgradation of this urban uh, water system is required uh, 
if there is an alternate route that needs to be uh, chalked out, if there is a funding that is required, if there is a rerouting of transmission line that needs to be done, or if there is a need to look for alternate water sources. So in case of disaster, in case of emergency like urban flooding, how they will make sure that the quality water reaches everyone. So that's an example from uh, I must, from uh, from uh, Philippines, uh, where the vulnerability index was calculated for each of the urban water system that is al already present to make sure that their urban water system is resilient. Uh, another project is uh, which UNESCO is working on is a is a new initiative is a global global water uh, pathogen project, which is a collaborative project uh, between uh, UNESCO and Michigan State University. So this project is about developing a knowledge hub at a global level on water related uh, disease risk and intervention. So all the global agencies which are uh, using uh, the pathogen uh, framework is it's a framework framework is quite old, it's 20 year old. Uh, so this project plan to revive that, revise that and the new technology that's coming in to build in that network for the future. Uh, so within, within uh, this project, there is also an initiative of providing a certification on the tap water. So that the governance is there is a certification on the governance that everything is happening at the at the right right way and the indirect idea behind it is to give uh, to give authority or to make uh, honest honest um, honesty to the population that the water that is coming in their tap is clean and they don't have to use the bottled water and also the purifier and the indirect benefit is is less and less use of the plastic that's what the idea really is it's basically for African countries. It's it's not for the Asian uh, countries. Um, another project which is quite interesting is Mega City Alliance uh, for Water Under Climate Change. Uh, so this Mega City Alliance uh, was developed by UNESCO in 2015 uh, during the COP21, which was held in Paris. So this alliance facilitate experience sharing between academic community and the water operators, basically municipal cooperation. So if any, um, any uh, new ideas or any testing has been done by any municipal corporation so that they can share the ideas with other mega cities which might be facing the same problem. So there is a information flow between different countries, but not at the center level, but at the water operator or the municipal corporation level. Uh, so in uh, 2015, 15 cities shared their ideas. There is a publication also from India. Mumbai uh, was part of this alliance. And this alliance, there is a second phase which is going to happen in December 2020. And we are in touch with different Indian uh, cities other than Delhi and Mumbai, if there are good examples that can be showcased in December 2020 to see how India is dealing with water scarcity under climate change. Another theme I would like to share example from is groundwater. So another project of uh, UNESCO is uh, groundwater assessment. So it's a worldwide hydrogeological mapping and assessment program. Uh, so it basically collate and visualize, analyze information on the groundwater. So these kinds of project is really important, especially for developing country, for their water governance part. Because what happens that many still developing countries, they don't have the capacity to even know the status of the groundwater. So when it comes to, uh, negotiations, when it comes to uh, transboundary issues with the neighboring country, then these countries face problem. That's where an organization like UNESCO, a neutral organization comes is provide them with the data. And this kind of data is also very important when a country uh, report for their SDGs. Uh, 
So the countries which still don't have the capacity to know the status, they can also report on their SDGs indicator using such kind of data. Uh, so there are many, um, uh, the database that has been prepared, I have, I have shared two maps. Another which is very important is the transboundary aquifers, uh, which has been delineated and it's open access uh, platform. Uh, another theme is water education. So youth is, is, is a priority for UNESCO. So there are many uh, platforms that UNESCO provide where youth uh, networks, youth individual network, they are invited to share their <clears throat> viewpoint. So there are example where youth declarations have been made, where there have been discussion on uh, advantages of pursuing career, there, there, have been, uh, there have been platform where youth have been invited to showcase their innovation, uh, research, and uh, different approaches from indigenous communities. So UNESCO has the priority and they provide platform. Uh, another uh, another uh, network system which UNESCO has made is a water information uh, system, which covers, so the first one was only for groundwater <clears throat> and transboundary. This one is for the entire water cycle from groundwater to urban water, through gender issues also from the local scale also to global scale also that can help decision making at every uh, step. It is also an open access and it was launched in 2017. So along with uh, the hydrological program and projects, there is a separate program on <clears throat> water assessment. So this is a flagship uh, program of UN Water with 31 UN Water members and international partners come together as, as an uh, umbrella of UN Water to come out with report, a comprehensive review every year on a different theme. So this was, these are the latest one. And in 2020, uh, it, <clears throat> the report was about uh, water and climate change. And uh, we translated it into Hindi also. Uh, another interesting, uh, within the assessment program, uh, it was realized that only 45% of the countries has any gender statistics related to water. So there is a, another project that is going on where a toolkit has been um, made uh, with to look at the water issue from the gender perspective. And uh, this toolkit has indicator, has methodology, guideline, how to collect data from a gender lens so that the countries can have gender transformative water policies. And policies can be made. And when they report for their SDGs, then they can use this data for the gender uh, indicator also and for the water and the water also from, from gender perspective. So these kinds of, this is a new initiative. So these kinds of results can be expected that in water gov governments, uh, governance, uh, what is the percentage uh, where uh, women as a key, key stakeholder are uh, presented, <clears throat> is taken, is presented uh, in climate adaptation, new policies that are being made uh, by uh, different countries. Uh, what is the gender lens in water for agriculture, in safe drinking water, in education, uh, whenever there is a capacity building program, how many uh, female women are trained? What is the number? Is there equality or not? Uh, Similarly, within the water education, there is a new initiative by uh, UNESCO where we are proposing a new indicator for water education. So presently under the SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation, the indicator, uh, the target 6 is by 2030, expand international cooperation and capacity building support to the developing countries in water and sanitation related activities. But this 6A cannot be fully monitored until unless there is a specific indicator on water education. So, it, so the 6A talks about capacity building, but doesn't talk about water education at a tertiary level. It talks about profession. It doesn't talk about uh, the tertiary level. So the UNESCO has proposed 
uh, a new indicator under this uh, target where number of the graduate from water related study courses in tertiary education uh, will be uh, evaluated and uh, uh, Right now, this new indicator is being tested in uh, four pilot countries in Latin America, Africa, in Arab states, and in Malaysia from uh, Asia and Pacific. Uh, under the theme three, these are the capacity building programs which UNESCO has run in uh, last one year, where in last one year they have trained uh, 300 water professionals from 68 countries and young professionals from 20 countries on uh, issues on research and policy, especially on pollutants. Uh, so there are many, so many of the projects that have talked about, uh, they basically uh, they are they are also part of the initiatives, different international initiatives, different networks. Like this is a youth network. It's an international initiatives. A uh, few of the examples only I would like to touch upon, like an international flood initiative, which focus on flood hazards uh, where countries can share their. Um, experiences, challenges, solution. Similarly, there is an international drought network, drought initiative, which talked about capacity building. Uh, there is a Jivadi network, which is about water and development, especially for the arid lands. There's a friend network, which talks about flow regimes. Uh, there is a help network, hydrology for environment, life and policy. So this network uh, was the part for the example that I gave from Philippines. So there is a, a, a water for peace also between different countries. Uh, there's a graphic project which talks about groundwater resource assessment, uh, which is a part of the example that I've already given. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm really mesmerized by the amount of information that you have shared with us. Uh, so moving on, moving ahead with the question and session for the webinar. Uh, I have a uh, few questions, but uh, I think that due to the scarcity of time, uh, we will be at least trying to have a one one question. Which aquifers in India are being studied under SDG 6 IHP program? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so these are all the Himalayan. So uh, we are also the EC mode. They are also partners with uh, UNESCO. So all the Himalayan countries, all the aquifer, uh, it, it's, it's a part of the network. It's a global network. All the aquifers will be covered. So it's not individual picking up and studying off on it. Uh, aquifer. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so go, moving on to the next question, I think uh, uh, Ripal sir can answer this. Uh, where does fountain shows water displays the amusement parks based on the theme of water, like water kingdom, etc., stand in its discourse of water governance and sustainability? Wow, wonderful. That's that's actually a very difficult and. Uh difficult question for me to answer, but very interesting. Now, this brings in the essence of, uh, in, in, a, in an area or in a country which is water scarce, why would you want to have amusement parks or, or these kind of entertainment facilities, which is not essential? Now, the question is who decides what is essential and who decides what is not essential? When we are gradually moving towards rapid urbanization, which is being steered by the so-called capitalists of the society, we are in no position to uh, kind of, you know, decide what is essential for what is essential and what is not. But then it is very interesting that being in a country, being in a, a country which has a setup which is democratic in nature, a lot of power, I mean, a lot of it lies with the people at large. Now, when you're talking about these kind of issues, which are very pertinent and have been questioned for decades, for long, long, long decades, what we have to do is we have to move a step forward. Uh, when we plan these kind of initiatives, which may seem to be non-essential to a larger population, but is essential for the, those populations who are steerheading uh, the so-called progress in our world, we need to develop in the, uh, in the regime of the existing governance system, 
the idea or the concept of what we know, what we call as mainstreaming disaster risk reduction or mainstreaming the idea of understanding disaster risk. For example, uh, if we talk about water as a resource in particular, all of us are aware of something which is called the water balance plan, right? Now, this had not been in vogue, but now it's eventually becoming, becoming uh, one of the uh, statutory mandate that is required. So when you plan certain things, when you plan certain, certain uh, amenities which are not so essential, you feel it's not essential, you have to do a proper risk assessment and that has to be mainstreamed into the governance mechanism. When, when you're planning for these kind of facilities like Water Kingdom in, in, in the times to come, you have to make an understanding of what risks are you ready to take up. For example, if you, if you are installing these kind of facilities, what is the quantum of water it will eventually uh, consume? And do we have that kind of resources to spare? If we do not have that kind of resources to spare, then it is up to the government to stop it. Of course, there are many issues that run in the uh, background, but then this is a system that has to be mainstream. That is the idea of understanding risk, considering risk, even before you kind of set up this kind of facility. So this is very essential. And interestingly, there are many countries, even in South Asia, like Pakistan, who have kind of uh, mainstreamed these ideas. Whenever they, whenever they um, develop new projects, develop new infrastructure, which is uh, water sensitive in that way. They have water sensitive in, in specific, but uh, they are risk sensitive in some ways. They have to go through this process of what is called risk screening, where we understand the, uh, uh, the, the quantum of risk that it will generate in the, in the times to come and how, uh, what amount of it we are ready to accept, what amount of it we are not ready to accept, it becomes the residual part of it and we try to act upon it. And this also brings me to uh, a, a very lovely quote, which I came across once. Uh, it says that it only takes a politician believing in what he says for the others to stop believing him. Now, this is very uh, a self-conflicting statement and very interesting one. What I want to say is that uh, all these things, uh, when we're talking about the governance is at, at, at the helm of it. And we all, we all have to come together and kind of push our will our willingness towards it to orient it in the right kind of way. So that is what needs to be done. Thank you, sir. Uh, Neha, ma'am, uh, for you, I have another question. Uh, recently, uh, NMCG Namami Ganga has initiated restoration of floodplain wetlands of Ganga. How eco hydrological intervention help in this context? What are the specific challenges in India regarding applying eco hydrological intervention? So that's where these alliances with the UN organization offer a platforms where uh, the uh, the already success story or even the risk involved in it has already which has which any other country any other state has already uh, faced uh, these alliances that's where play a very important part where already a restoration has been done in a similar climatic situation if there is an example then those can again be tested you don't need to uh, again test it from the baseline but you can directly take the example uh, from that countries the the second question was uh, i'm sorry i missed the second question the uh, the part of it there's a sub part what are the, what are the specific challenge in india regarding yeah. applying eco uh, hydrological intervention uh, i think uh, what i have done from my experience is is the is the space issue would always be there the land policy uh, you need for flood plains it's it's the land basically. So the moment you talk about developing a new wetland, even the restoration of the wetland, wetland that would require taking out people from there, that's, that's for me is the biggest challenge in India that Europe might not face or the country like Australia might not face, but South Asian countries, yes, they would face. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think uh, I'm, I have a question as well. <laughs> so it's for both of the panelists. Uh, according to the uh, SDGs report of 2019, 785 million people still remain without basic drinking water. One out of four healthcare facilities worldwide lack basic drinking water services. 
Two million people live in countries experiencing high water stress, and by 2030, 700 million would be displaced by intense water scarcity. And this was uh, 2019 when we didn't know about COVID-19, and now it's in place. We know the amount of uh, extra uses of water that has been done. So how do we see? How do we need to govern this? Because uh, what I personally feel is the regions like uh, Dubai, places like Dubai and all where excess water, like what was the first question that was put up to Repulsa has been done. I think communities or the organizations, big organizations or even countries should come together in equal distribution of water in such scenarios. So I just wanted to have both of your views on this uh, in these terms. Uh, Repulsa first, please. Okay, so you want me to answer this? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, can can you? It, it, it's actually a big chunk of question. Can you summarize it in one line? Because that's the task that I want you to do. So that will help okay. me answer it. It's, it's, okay. Yeah. So the question for you is like in the 2009 report, uh, 19 report, we have seen that there are uh, huge issues by the 2030. But when 2019 COVID-19 has been play, uh, come into place, the uses of water has been extra. So where do you see the future projection and what does the countries need to do in this regard for that the proper water governance is done, which I mean by good water governance? True. Okay. So uh, thank you for the question. This is an interesting one. Again, uh, the fir first things first, do you think many of, many of us, most of our countries that uh, do they actually have this idea of what quantum of water is available for use? That's a very important question that needs to be asked. And if that is available, because there are countries, there are regions where this kind of studies are available, how those studies, which are already available, are being used by the decision makers? That's, that's also very important. Uh, for example, there, 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 uh, there have been uh, discourses in the academic in, and in the research fields where people try to understand these kind of problems. They try to understand this kind of emergent risks and they put it in their own researches. But these researches generally do not reach the people who are responsible for making decisions, like the administrators, for example. So there is this gap also, right? So first of all, there is this gap. In, in, in countries where do, they do have the resource to understand these kind of problems, they have the have the resources, but they have this gap of communication where the, the evidences that, that they, there are, they are not being communicated properly. That's the first thing. And, and the second thing is for those countries which do not have the resources to undertake this kind of research, this kind of project, this kind of study in a large scale. For those countries, there is an essential need for other well-to-do countries uh, to come together. It's almost similar to uh, what we have been doing for a long while in climate action. Uh, you know the climate development mechanisms uh, when when all the uh, uh, all the uh, well-to-do countries come together and help the developing countries and the least developed nations. So that is also another way of doing it. But then that involves a lot of uh, friction among, uh, in, at the international level. So I am not sure about how useful that would be. But when we talk about this problem, it, it I think it again comes back to acting in a very local way. These kind of studies have been undertaken in some places. Some places it has not been undertaken. So you have to start at the local level. Let's say in case of India, where there is a different kind of administrative setup, you have to start from understanding these kind of problems in, at the district level or at the village level. And, and once you kind of build up this momentum of doing these kind of things, for example, the water balance plan I was talking about, once this comes into vogue, once this is in momentum, things will come into place. Yes, the problem is that now we are at, not even at the inception of it. We have a long way to travel to, that's true. But then we have to start. So that is my way of thinking, uh, my way of looking at it. Thank you, sir. Which uh, situation and water governance? So, uh, I will not take much of the time to answer that because I think we have already exceeded 15 minutes. Uh, so I would just like to add that uh, the COVID situation has brought in 
again the the social equity means the water scarcity was always for a different section of the society it was never there for a different section of the society but now government knows that they have to provide a clean water to that section of the society they have to make sure otherwise you'll not stop that pandemic you need water for washing hands that's the basic thing which every government every sector every every individual has realized so that that's it i would like to add thank you ma'am uh, to all the uh, participants those are there i think uh, you can also search for timur leste who has done a wonderful job in during the covid time and the situation of water crisis recently i think the participants those who are interested then also can study the example of the what timur leste has done during uh, this covid times so uh, moving ahead as uh, we are running ripal kanji and dr neha meeda for answering the questions i would like to thank both of you for making us travel towards the road uh, with a very different perspective on water governance as a closing remark i would like to say that water governance often focuses heavily on infrastructure investment overlooking the importance of investing in capacity building and developing institutions at national regional and local level of course through the discussion with uh, uh, dr neha meeda and Ripal, uh, dr ripol kanji i know uh, these things are changing at a slow pace in india but yes we are making a change uh, i guess the participants have noted the important takeaways from this webinar on behalf of water youth network i would like to thank all of you the speakers participants and the supporting organi organizations for this wonderful knowledge sharing session so live without love not one without water and with this also a big thank you to all of you for being part of this webinar thank you and have a nice weekend thank you so much take care thank bye you bye thank you bye bye thank you bye bye